set off on a path to find something that has no destination, has no location. It's simply, uh, a, I guess, what would you say? It's an ethereal matter that's floating in your mind. But I, but I think it came out of your mind, you know, George. Oh, yeah. it came out of, and, and, and it came out of a mind that's um, willing to um, let go and find the vision, but also coming through a, I mean, I've been meet, talking with this guy all summer and coming through a really um, deep sensitivity towards um, emotion. Um, I, I yeah. feel that in your work. It's like we were talking one time about glimpsing uh, when you see, and this goes back to Jerry Lewis looking in the mirror, when you, when you glimpse someone passing on the bus or uh, staring out of a taxi cab or you know, looking out of a Starbucks window and you just glimpse them and you see some other side of their face that they don't see, uh, not the presentation, the face that presents itself to the world, but some deep, scary side of it that's very, to me, very um, tragic and emotional and sad but at the same time genuine. And a lot of your paintings capture that um, to me. They capture that, uh, that glimpse. That, and, and, and then I see it as the glimpse of the self, too. Uh, the glimpse of when we're looking in the mirror and we don't really know we're looking in the mirror and so we see that yeah, right. grotesque thing and we're like, what the fuck, that's my face. I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but it's a like totally human emotion, you know? Um, I see that in your writing, though. I mean, your characters are, are I was talking about that one uh, story that David wrote, The Project, where people go on these worldwide, I don't know if, if, you, if you haven't read it, you should. It's, it's one of the short stories, and it's, it's like the opposite, I mean, people buy tickets to go to the southern tip of uh, someplace like South America and film penguins, and, and uh, this guy just goes in his living room, finds a spot in the corner that nobody ever would care about or pay any attention to, examines it almost microscopically, and then finds another spot, like uh, in, the, in the air shaft or, or, or the air conditioning vent or something, and finds himself up there while his family's that kind of downstairs having Thanksgiving dinner going, where, are, where is he? <laughs> He's upstairs investigating the reality of a, you know, a dust kitty. And uh, I think that's a really um, kind of, uh, th those kind of uh, characters, those kind of um, that you work with in your in your books, um, I think are the kind of characters that probably, you know, I don't know, they, they make for an interesting uh, subject for paintings as well. Yeah. I mean, uh, and they're boxed up. I mean, the, the thing about a painting and, and a, sh a short story. One of the reasons why I write stories is because I can catch that voyeuristic glimpse and then that's it you know it's you get that photograph you get that p painting and then you're left with um, and you you carry it forward for the rest of time which is what I feel when I'm looking at your work it's like you got okay there's the butler but how do you decide my... what language to use to describe them that's the question that people might ask you know a painter like how do you just decide that when you see somebody that in your mind looks like a Rembrandt why would you paint them like, let's say, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, Bugs Bunny? Yeah. yeah, I think I think that's what we were talking about earlier about this uh -huh. incredibly complicated process of collecting di ideas, using journals, um, attending, you know, attending shows, looking at art, and um, and then finally letting go and having this sort of sudden flash of letting it all come out and. Uh, what I think is interesting about your work is that your virtuosity is, you know, a, you can paint in uh, these different styles. You do, and, and um, with a story, you can do the same thing. You can have a story that's um, more of a Raymond Carver realistic mode, and then you can have another story that's just kind of more whimsical and cartoony. Um, it confuses the critics, you know. They don't, and it confuses Americans. Let's. I, I was saying that I don't, I'm not sure, maybe this is too general, but I'm not sure if Americans like virtuosity, the idea of virtuosity, the idea that you can actually do a bunch of different things. Maybe it's not Americans, maybe it's just uh, me, maybe it's something, I don't know. <laughs> you know it's, it's an easy word to throw around, and um, it's a way of describing somebody's uh, sort of emotive output, 
put it that way. Like some people are virtuosos at breaking down and going crazy. Some people are virtuosos <laughs> at uh, you know having a thousand cups of coffee a day. Some people are virtuosos at drinking more than anybody else. And uh, it's just it's it's relative, to, you know, phrase. But other people are unwilling to, uh, and maybe and sometimes they have a power in, in sustaining a lack of that. I mean, in, in sticking with their very near, not a narrow vision, but a sort of secure vision, and that's that works too. But the other the other way can can work. Yeah. As your work attests, it attests. Well, you do what it takes to make a painting, and you do what it takes to write a story, and just to, like you know, work can be extremely sort of. You know, at times there'll be a really horrible thing happening, and the writing is so floral and beautiful, and sort of almost kind of Proustian in some ways. But it's applied to those kind of things that normally wouldn't necessarily uh, be uh, ornamented in such a way. You know, and I think that's that's an interesting way of doing things. I mean, they talk about the idea of let's just say people would say in in an earlier time if you worked with different styles, you might be criticized as being eclectic. And, uh, oh, that's really eclectic. And that's, uh, you know, it's a pastiche or, or something like that. And if you think like, well, if you take it over to another level where you can say, well, maybe it's, think of it in terms of the dialectic experience, a kind of a, uh, a sort of a harmonic resolution of conflicting uh, Opposites, and if you can resolve those things in a harmonic and sort of beautiful and poetic or painterly way, I think that's a great thing to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Massimiliano? Um, I'm listening. No, I have a question actually. <clears throat> You're Italian. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm built to all this thing <laughs> in melodrama. Um, now, uh, I had a question for both of you, and uh, particularly in a way to George, because you, you're talking about characters. And I don't know many painters for whom I could use the word characters when it comes to describing their paintings. I think that's something very special of your work. That um, you know, th there is a lot of talk about the, the, the virtuosistic aspect, the Renaissance and the Baroque quotation and so on. But there is something so specific about your work that when I look at it, uh, those creatures, and I keep calling them that way, they are. Um, Characters and there is an understanding that uh, you know there is not a story in the narrative, but well, there is something about them that makes them uh, something else than a subject, for example. Yeah. And uh, how do you think that happens? And is it something that you want to achieve consciously, or they came out that way? The other day you say something beautiful. You say that uh, you never wanted to make them consciously as old master paintings. They they just came out old. Yeah. And uh, and that is something quite amazing. Also. If you, you know, I mean, myself, when I talk about characters, I think about probably, let's take a, a writer like Shakespeare. I mean, that's what they are, they're characters. Or I think of playwrights, they're characters, and they, they direct them in this play. And those characters are, it's, in order for those characters to have any quality, they have to be believable. And that was one of the other things that, I was thinking like about at one point was that certain characters that you see in movies or in television programs will be so believable that you can't ever think of the actor as anything other than those particular characters. And uh, in paintings of um, real people, <clears throat> portraits, commissioned portraits, they're never really characters. They're um, actual representations of somebody. But when they're imaginary, they are characters. They are characters that have to be made believable. And uh, their attributes are somehow the things they're holding, the things they're wearing, the, the expressions on their face, the way that they're in the painting, uh, sort of uh, positioned in the painting. And you can direct their uh, <coughs> existence somehow by making them believable. And I think that's, that's why I think of them as characters. But in another way, people would say uh, characters is, 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 you know, you could think of it as a sort of a less important thing than a real uh, being. And, um, but I don't. I don't know. How do you think of the characters, or what do you call them when you're writing? Are they characters? Or are they people? What are they? I mean, you make them up. Uh, I think, uh, fictional, fictional. 
I, you something know, or another. The only thing that comes is that character comes out of the distortion. You know, it comes out of the, the predicament. <laughs> um, you know, it really does. It's a cliche to say, you know, character is action or character is predicament or situation, but it really is. And even <laughs> even in the, that idea of looking in the mirror, that distortion that you see in your, you know, that's 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 where your character. Otherwise, there's nothing. It's really just kind of a, it doesn't exist. In, in the literary world and probably in the art world too. I mean, that's why portraits are often not really fun to look at because they're just kind yeah. of there, even no matter how great they are. I mean, they're just static and they're rep they represent, I don't know, whoever. And yeah, just, I mean, you go to the museum, you look at them and you're like, this is a brilliant, great, you know, s sitting of a character and that's it. But you don't really get moved by them the way you do. When you, I mean, Mona Lisa, I don't know much about, really that much about but um, Mona Lisa, you know, what is it? Her mouth or something, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like that mouth. It, it doesn't matter it's that she's. Yeah, it's <laughs> must, and it, there is a move. There is a character there. That's why people go look at it because it's it's, it's there is something there um, that's beyond just a, a portrait. It's yeah, that's a kind of transposition of a sphinx-like look. You know, it's just enigmatic uh, sort of undefined expression of some sort. And um, I think that's what transfixing about that painting. And just, you, you can look at it and look at it and look at it forever. And uh, it's not the most exciting painting that was ever painted. There's no real, you know, there's no, it's not a joyous or a happy or an ecstatic or a, or, or a crazy painting, but maybe that's what it is. It's the craziest painting that was ever made because of that. <laughs> I don't know. Like we said, you must know. 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 You know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, outside of, uh, you know, subject matter for art, when you think like that's another subject, let's say, is the idea of what is, what constitutes subject matter in painting. Um, is it, you know, at, at the time of, let's just say, the uh, abstract expressionists, the dissolution of a kind of European uh, concept of subject matter and turned into this new found language of painting that was a kind of, uh, I guess you could say, a, a subjective experience of the painter and his feelings and just it didn't represent anything except those feelings and uh, but then as a viewer I say this uh, about the paintings upstairs in this abstract figuration room that when I look at those paintings Clement Greenberg and uh, Harold Rosenberg said there's you're not seeing faces you're not seeing people you're not seeing lampposts you're not seeing a, you know a cat being bit by a dog. You're seeing uh, brush strokes and you're seeing pure paint. And I just kept seeing faces and people <laughs> and, and lampposts and trees and other kinds of things. And I thought, I'm just gonna paint what it is that I see when I look at those paintings and transcribe all of what it is that I think I see when I look at abstraction. And even, I think the key is, it's what you think you see that you're painting. and. Uh, and maybe it's what you think is real that you're right about. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I was thinking about when you were talking about abstraction that evolutionary neurologists now think that the ability to, to see abstraction, and when you see abstraction, you're, you know, we had to be able to dis distinguish objects um, that were camouflaged in a kind of chaotic landscape. So we were always looking for that recognizable object in, in the in the in the in the um, abstraction, and um, I don't know why that was popping into my head while you were talking. So, um, but it was it's um, I don't know. I I think I guess I kind of again to go back to the idea of visions and dreams that are really deep. I mean something about the Greek. You mentioned the Greeks, and I was thinking about the Furies and the idea of these entities that were subsurface. You know that were sort of controlling everything. Um, I'm I'm not sure. I. I, all I know is that I, I began writing stories that got published after going to the Hopper show like 15, 17 years ago. And um, like 
I know hoppers kind of almost a cliche, but looking at the hoppers, I was like, you know, I can write about solitude and isolation. I don't have to have a bunch of stuff going on. I can write about it, these, this kind of situation, almost a physical feeling. Um, and then I started writing, and then years later, the Tate Museum contacted me about their hopper show. And I said, how? You know, and they were like, well, you, you're work." And um, it all kind of came around. I'm like, okay, maybe that meant something. But uh, so it's kind of, I think it's really, the process is huge and deep um, for me. And it doesn't always work. Sometimes I, you know, go through this long process, and then the, the, the end, end product is just thrown away, tossed out. But, um, yeah, I mean, I guess the uh, the uh, the idea of like and kind of say an American art, what is that? You know, and Hopper represents like a concept of American art, which is, is kind of weird to me. The idea that there's any like there's a nationalistic tag put on kind of painting of some sort that the European art, there's American art, there's African art, there's, you know. Spanish art, and it's like, sure, the people come from somewhere, and they bring their culture to the table wherever they go and uh, express it, but, but uh, he seems to be particularly iconic of an American form of art. And uh, what's interesting is if you analyze it from a painter's point of view, it's a sort of an extension of Impressionism really, to me, you know, his time that he spent in Paris and the <coughs> early paintings of the Quai Voltaire and the, the different scenes of the, the Seine and the rivers and, and in looking at Monet and Manet and capturing this idea of reflections and he might have gone from the idea of things reflecting in water to people reflecting about their lives and that's an interesting transition that he might have made. And then you see these very self-reflective moments in his painting, and I think that's a kind of a beautiful uh, move from the idea of reflections and impressionism to reflections in psychology, let's just say, or self-reflection somehow. And it was deep, I was thinking it was deep in the air. Um, I was thinking Hemingway was incredibly influenced by Cezanne. Like he basically said, I learned how to write my pristine sentences from going and looking at Cezanne. Um, and there was sort of something in the air at the, about this sort of isolation and clarity at that time, post, I guess it was post World War I, right after that, and yeah. around then. But um, Can I interrupt? Yes, please. No, because I, I also have to remind you that Edward Hopper is a cliche. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I actually, as, as you were talking so beautifully about his work, I was also thinking of the importance of minor traditions in, in your work. Uh, and, uh, you know, and as I was thinking of minor traditions, I was thinking of uh, minor literature and what Deleuze and Guattari wrote about minor literature. And so I was thinking of your work and how you've spoken about, of course, Kafka and the, the, the tradition also of minor um, uh, forms of art. And so I was wondering how, for both of you, um, if at all you took inspiration from what is usually outside the confines of high art. And in the case of, of George, it's also quite interesting because, of course, there is the, 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 the memory of Robert Crumb, Mad Magazine, and the whole comic. But there is also uh, a lot of art that is so serious, so refined, that has become kitsch. You, know, you see it in your work, there is a lot of um, sort of baroque that it's almost baroque to the point that it's unbearable. And so I was curious to know how do you relate to those traditions that are less accepted and hopper and uh, uh, I mean I think about it like probably from my days of studying music in, in college um, about Bartok for example where a lot of his pieces were coming from folk you know folk music and that uh, a lot of the Compositions, let's just say, someone like Beethoven or someone would borrow sort of farmers' songs and things of that nature and find a way to put that into their art. And because they found it beautiful, they found it very like real and very you know sort of humanistic and and in this sort of human element. And so, you know, people like uh, 
kids like cartoons, people like cartoons, you get brainwashed with cartoons as a child, you know, and, and it's a way to sort of, you know, because they, they're, they personify people like, um, you know, like Bugs Bunny or Porky Pig and these kind of characters are, are sort of personifications of real people and that's how they started. And so I think sometimes about these cartoons struggling to come out the other side and be people again. And uh, so they might have a kind of kitschy element to them just because they, um, you know, they come from the idea that you think about the idea of kitsch and you think about the idea of, let's just take the uh, concept of the souvenir shop. If you land in a souvenir shop, you know you've made it, okay? There's only <laughs> so much art that you're ever going to see in a souvenir shop that's actual fine art. You might see the Pieta of Michelangelo being sold all over the world. You may see the Mona Lisa. You may see, you know, you'll see a JFK a piggy bank. You know, you'll see a statue of the, uh, you know, the Statue of Liberty. And if one of your works of art finally makes it to the level of a souvenir shop in that degree, then you really are up there on the top of the ladder. And, uh, you know, so I mean, I don't know how that works, but that's just sort of the truth. <laughs> maybe that's why they... Uh, I mean, you know, the, I, you learn a lot about art from them. calendars. You get calendars and they have beautiful pictures on them. And in January is the snow scene by Bellows. You know, <laughs> summer is the uh, water lilies of Monet. And you think, Gee, I wonder if I could ever do a painting that would fit in on, you know, March. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, I wonder if, <laughs> and, and just sort of, I mean, I guess, I don't know. But I don't have a, I don't, I don't like to try to think of ways of defining uh, genres of paintings on those kind of uh, levels. I think if something means a lot to somebody, then nobody really has the right to put it down. If, if, if somebody really loves that little, you know, plastic uh, doll on their bureau, then why isn't it, you know, important? Why, why can't that be important? So I guess, yeah, you can draw from the emotional response to things and make a connection between that and sort of hope that your own work that might draw in those, uh, you know, those responses will, 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 I don't know, be shared by others or somehow. It kind of makes me think about like, um, Finnegan's Awake, uh, the night book, Joyce's night book, and the kind of submerged nightmare dreamscape.